face time and day. Donald Trump's election campaign team has said its internal communications have been sent to the Yeah, I think uh, 
this sport has been uh, amazing for me and it's been something to sort of get away from. Uh, sort of, yeah, I've seen that sort of time, but I'm just wanting to be something good for people to enjoy if uh, things aren't going so well in a, in a belief, uh, belief environment. What is it in your life to win the gold? I know that rowing is extremely competitive at every level. An Olympic gold, does it make you remember the first time you hit the water? I think a little bit. I think the thing that came to memory most of all when I sort of crossed the line and redone it was uh, the amount of work that the crew had put in. Like it's a massive team sport, there's nine of us, ten including coach, and I've been alongside my teammates every step of the way, and you almost see everything that they've put in and I think my biggest worry going into it was that their future, their dreams are in my hands as well as mine and theirs and I had the ability if things went wrong to so ruin nine people's dreams and uh, cross the line having sort of done the teammates proud and um, you know got them the result that they, they were sort of dreaming of it was just a huge relief because I think uh, to them and I've seen everything they put into the sport and to, to have taken that away from them would have been harrowing so you know the idea that we've, we've done it and I've done my teammates proud and you know they've done me proud was such a great feeling. I mean live on Radio 4 on the closing day you're giving some insight into what being part of the team is so thank you for that. Let me go to individual achievements. I think many listeners have travelled with Sir Andy Murray. Have you? Have you looked up to the Scottish tennis tonight? Yes, absolutely. And actually, uh, I uh, I got COVID uh, a few times, a few days uh, for the we were set to travel out to Paris on the Eurostar, and um, I actually got delayed travelling, and I wasn't sure I'd even make it out if COVID didn't sort of sort itself out quickly enough to have that symptoms. Um, but anyway, I came on a later Eurostar and had the pleasure of, uh, of coming back with Andy Murray, who was on my train. Um, I'm not entirely sure he, he knows who I am, but I sort of looked at it all right. I think I might have been in the background, he's sort of through his uh, fan, uh, fan selfies, and um, so I was trying to get out of the way of that, but yeah, I tried to travel with him, and um, it, as I said earlier, like being mentioned in the same conversation as some of these athletes is, it doesn't make sense to me, and like, I can't believe that's why I am right now. Well, the uh, people who know here in the building say rightly so. Thank you for joining us on the closing day. Tom Cruise got a leak from a helicopter. Can you tell us an exclusive? Sorry? Is Tom Cruise got a leak from a helicopter at the closing ceremony? I have no idea. I'm on my way there from southern Paris, but uh, if he does that, I'm going to very much enjoy watching him in person. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks a lot. And again, uh, in every sense. The games have finally cheered up the French, according to the legend of the Galileo. Nelson Montfort has been publicly since 1992. Says his countrymen and women have been on a similar journey to the British. Well, he didn't want to get completely condemned the game in advance, only to be proved totally wrong. I've been asked a few times to make a comparison between our two cities. London and Paris, and I, I really think that the situation is, is really very similar. Before the game, there was a lot of people who were very eager to criticize. And once the game started, actually, immediately after the game started, day one and day two, the mood totally changed. I have to say, now 16 days later, rather than the French closing ceremony tonight, I think the mood is, is really excellent. Not only Sporting events are also good, and it's probably more important for the general atmosphere that surrounds this game. Mm. Those of us who have been able to travel have been watching the uplifting athletes, the amazing dedication from, from our countries, and it, both you, the French, and we, the British, had shock general elections, and we have recently had riots on the street. You are famous in, in France for your public manifestation.
been put aside for, for three weeks. Now we're going to have to see what, what is going to happen. Can I say that the Olympic Games finally cheered up the friend? Yes, that is a very good point. That is a very good topic. And of course, the question, the question that, that is, how long is, how long is it going to last? And what about the sporting successes that you've most enjoyed? You've had a ringside seat. Uh, you've been covering uh, sports and politics since the 1980s. Did you have moments that you found particularly uplifting? I have very vivid memories of the of the Town Hall three gold seat beating the world record in full ball after after he had already won the gold medal. And I also have a very fond memory of Noah Lyons, the American swimmer winning the 100 meter dash by five thousandths of a second. Not even one hundredth of a second is going to change his life. And finally, I was surprised you didn't mention one name, which to my British ears evokes your singing of the Marseillaise national anthem, which is Neil Marshall, your champion swimmer. The Queen Marshall, the surname, is very similar to Marshall, the words of your national anthem, and I found that to, to be a sort of surprising coincidence and very moving. Of course, but Marshall, Marshall. of the Olympics to these deeply distressing images and incidents of this Gaza war, which has just reached its grim two-month mark. It is, and also there's a clear strategy, which is to assassinate Hamas and Islamic Jihad leaders. And it, this is Israel's explanation for bombing a school. Israeli leaders Minister Netanyahu has made it clear that his main aim in this war, to use his words, is to destroy Hamas and Islamic Jihad. But what we are hearing, and there is a growing force of criticism from key Israeli allies, including the United States and, and Britain, saying that yes, you have a right to defend yourself, as in the words of Kamala Harris, you can go after Hamas. But as she put it, do you also have an important responsibility to avoid civilian casualties? The EU foreign policy chief, Joseph Burrell, was even more blunt. He said there is no justification for these massacres. There's been this terrible dynamic in this war that at the time 
time and again, uh, Heidi, that Israel says it has, as it did this time, it has clear intelligence, but in this case, there are top members of Hamas and Islamic Jihad who are sheltering in this school. It says it acts in accordance with international law, that it uses precise targeting, that there are no women and children. And yet, it's hard to swear at that with the grisly images which are e emerging of body shredded, children screaming, and a, a, a spokesperson for the UN Children's Fund saying I was at that compound just days ago and it was packed with some 2,000 people, including women and children. And Hamas, of course, then denies that it uses civilian infrastructure uh, for, uh, for, for its own command and control. The UN says that in recent months, 17 schools have been hit, which is why there is a growing sense of alarm that there has to be a ceasefire in this war. That's what Kamala Harris has called for. Um, just a question on Hamas. Uh, the people who try to issue dissent themselves in Gaza get their limbs broken or their lives lost. And then back to Israel, where the families of hostages, many of them appeared on the beach, have criticized the Prime Minister Netanyahu. So the question for you, please, is where is the leadership that will bring us this time? In the midst of a US general election with Joe Biden seen as weaker, do we have to wait until November for any kind of action on a ceasefire? He's really Prime Minister again. Uh, keeps saying that he's doing everything possible to try to end this war, destroy Hamas, bring the hostages home. But in recent weeks, there have been more and more uh, reports in Israeli media from Israeli officials, including the negotiators at those protracted ceasefire talks, saying that the Prime Minister has no interest in a ceasefire deal, that he just wants to continue prosecuting this war for as long as he can because he knows that when the war ends, there will be very, very uncomfortable questions about his responsibility in not keeping the people of southern Israel safe when his Hamas went on his murderous rampage uh, on October 7th last year. And similarly, Hamas is to be blamed that all those who criticize Israel uh, for this intolerable level of civilian casualties also criticize Hamas for hiding inside civilian infrastructure like schools. And just take this recent, the recent offer on the table, a, joint, a, a, a rare statement by the leaders of the United States, Qatar and Egypt, the main negotiators in this deal to end the war and to bring the hostages home. Uh, <coughs> that it will send a negotiating team. But Hamas has so far been silent because they have also been putting down conditions that Israel says it's impossible to accept. So we also hear reports that huh, pressure is growing on Hamas as well to bring an end to this unbearable suffering of the people of Gaza. But the new leader of Hamas, the hardline Yaya Sinwar, who's believed to be hiding in a bunker somewhere in Gaza, who keeps uh, we understand that he has been pushing for the war to continue. There's He's now been elected as the, or chosen as the, the new leader of Hamas. Pressure is mounting on him as well to say, end it now. Back on the edge. Listeners from the Isles of City say an experiment nicknamed Game of Drones proves male bees cross the sea to find many things. Using current dots to represent individual islands that was launched two years ago. Jim Halliday, our friends who sent us this postcard back then. We're halfway through since we did mark them, and we did that literally on the thorax and just below the head. It'd be great if we could see some other coloured drones here, that's what we really would see if the islands, bees are hopping over. Have you talked to the other beekeepers? They highly suspect that, don't they? Yeah. It must, I mean, surely, I mean, nature. Jilly's okay. back on the edge. Jilly, welcome back. This time you've spotted bees, uh, drones from one island on the other. Yeah, yeah, really exciting news. We hopped off the press from the Isles of Scilly and it's been the most fantastic week. So you're hearing this as we're hearing it on the islands. It's that significant. So for us, it means that three years of hard 
of work. Um, we've now spotted um, honeybees, three bees drones on uninhabited islands, which means that the bees do indeed cross the water. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited on the islands to hear that. Yes, yeah, um, I can hear that your voice, Charles Carroll, is here. He's got a question on head start is here, Charles. Is this the, the, the reason that they're crossing the sea is to go and get queen bees, is it, rather than just that they sit like in the flowers of the island? Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. We, we, we're absolutely convinced that they are crossing to mate with um, virgin queens. That, that's what we really How do you know? really think. It was because we discovered, so this is the update, um, with Dr. Stephen Fleming, who is a great drone expert, and he, um, a geographer too, so with his knowledge with finding drone congregation sites on the island where honeybees do congregate to mate every year. So these special places, a bit like salmon, how they come back and migrate every year, this is what we're finding with honeybees too. What, um, what is it there? Um, effort. I was talking about the Olympics. These little insects fly two kilometres against the wind. They do, and this is this is where we're really finding new it, it's new boundaries, if you like. There's more questions that's come out of this. So the bees are clearly much more resilient than we had even hoped for. They are flying, and um, so uh, let's see, twenty. We recorded twenty um, kilometre. Um, sorry, kilometres an hour wind speeds and they were coming across from, um, we know for sure now from Tresco because we were dotting the, um, the, the honeybees there or the drone bees blew on their thorax and we were just gobsmacked when we got to Samson which is the, the west of, of Tresco. We can see St Agnes and St um, St Mary's in the distance and, and to, the, to the north we can see Briar too so we were really shaken up is the word and gobsmacked when we found netted at the top of our lure where we have drone um, queen pheromone on the top of this lure which is on the top of the hill um, and with a five five meter rod with the pheromone at the top so there's a lair with queen pheromone on and we um, we found drones wanting to make with our, our Ten queen, if you like. So this pheromone was drifting across the water, um, and now for these things to come, and these um, and make them queen. Um, and then the Chancellor Thomas, 
but simply won't be enough with these students to go around this year in a way that will protect the university's financial situation. And we'll be talking about that with Philip Organ, who's the man who the last review, government review of uh, higher education. Thank you very much indeed. That was supposed to you. Uh, it's Radio 4, Sunday the 11th of August. Hello. This is Broadcasting House in a programme from the building of the set. Here with me is Charles Kelly. It's the final day of the Paris Olympics, and Great Britain has two more medals to beat the total of 64 from Tokyo. The organisers have hailed the games as an incredible success. The Justice Minister, Shabana Mahmoud, says dealing with the day is a variety and will have an impact on the courts and prison system for months and years to come. And the Ukrainian President, Volodymyr Zelensky, has acknowledged for the first time that his military is conducting a cross-border attack inside Russia's western Kursk region. Back home, where the business secretary, Jonathan Reynolds, has urged insurance firms to pay up the shops smashed in the lives. He's our guest at the moment. Outside the shop in Anger have been community efforts to clean things up. The court has come out to claim that their fellow members are being Liverpool set on fire because obviously, if you're right, you must destroy books. And it left behind almost nothing but a few more. When the author, Marnie Richards, saw the destruction, she decided to send a box of her own books to help her stop the shelf. Then the others followed suit. It's disgusting that these books, ostensibly they wanted to make a political point, but in what way is trashing a local library a really valuable resource for the community? Any kind of political statement, that's just vandalism. And I got really angry because I am a working class origin woman, and it was through my local library that I gained a love of reading. And then I thought, well, I'll put a tweet out and I'll say I'm going to donate my backlist to spell out her library to help restock it because obviously there is that kind of pressing need to just put books in the hands of readers and it's gone viral and um, in the first couple of days I've got 115 authors pledging to donate their books and um, the following day I've got another 150. Books in Britain, read them or burn them? That seems to have been the question for the last few weeks. The government was set to release prisoners early before the riots is now locking up more people in a nip them quick plan. It's the one first rolled out in 2011 by the then Director of Public Prosecutions, Keir Starmer. Jonathan Reynolds is the Secretary of State for Business. He joined me a moment before we came on air. He's written to the Association of British Insurers, the ABI, to urge quick checks written. For businesses that are insured, I want those claims dealt with swiftly. That's why I've contacted the ABI on that. Now, they are doing everything I would ask of them at this stage. I do also want to say, given some of the businesses I've met who've been affected by this, that where a business is not insured or it's underinsured, there are still potentially ways to help them, and the right compensation act kicks in. And for a business that has suffered damage or disruption or, or theft of property, that can be covered for them, and there's a way, a uh, very straightforward way for them to be able to, to get that redress. So, I want to make sure that we are getting people the support that they need, and also to be frank, getting out a message to the public that if they feel as strongly as I do about this, get out there and support these local businesses as well. You know, give them your support, that'll make a big difference to them. How shocked have you been? You came here as a new minister on day one, or even day two, really, effectively, of your, of your life as a new Secretary of State. When you saw Britain's streets erupt, I say Britain's, they had the rise right in Scotland. Did you feel embarrassed, ashamed of our country? All of those things, a sense of frustration too. I think what has been particularly difficult to see is the way that, first of all, disinformation has been such a key part of this, and second of all, the way I think you know, there has been uh, in the fringe elements of, of politics attempts to pursue an agenda um, that was always there and to exploit, to be frank, an absolutely horrendous uh, situation. Who, who's been named names? Nigel Farage, Bishop Patel? I think, look, first of all, some of this has come from, from the far right in terms of some of that disinformation, and particularly. But Nigel Farage said we should be told the truth about the, what policing is. I think most people know what they're doing. I think they are a little bit cowardly in terms of trying to stoke it a little bit. Do you think Bishop Patel's character, which says there's a perception of two tier policing, or is there a perception of two-tier? I think by saying there's a perception, 
she's trying to put credentials to a certain viewpoint without having the courage to say that herself. I mean, there is no two-tier police in, in the UK. So you picture Patel and Cow. I think those comments were, I think regrettable from you know, someone who aspires to be a mainstream politician. But I, I want to be clear that I think the, the core disinformation has come from the further right and you know, it's for people in the Conservative Party to account for their own relationship to those viewpoints. So there is no two-tier policing and people try to put that forward. I think first of all they can't verify those claims but second of all they are as I say trying to in some cases exploit the terrible situation for the world. Would you contrast the role of Elon Musk with the king? So the king's backing people who build things up. Elon Musk says there's a risk of civil war. I mean, there's just no way those comments from Elon Musk can be justified. Should he be arrested if he comes to the UK? Uh, I'm pretty sure Christmas dinner is that is that the ultimate plan? What do you think? Of anybody who is spreading any sort of disinformation on social media will be held to account for that. There have already been actions taken in the UK against people for that. I think there is a responsibility from all the social media companies, which in the main they are exercising. They don't well, how would you rate his behaviour? I think it's extremely irresponsible and unjustified with how comments that we made. Dan Hodges in the Mail on Sunday says that people portrayed Sir Keir Starmer as a liberal left, but actually, if you look back to 2011, he was the nip and quick czar. Do you think the policy has worked? I do. I think it's incredibly important that not only does the judicial system respond swiftly to the kind of soul, but some of the people see that. They understand it's responsive. That would be all great. Bang on the door, film it, put it on TV, we're coming to you. 780 arrests uh, so far, 350 charges, more to come in the system. I think it's really important that people see, first of all, the policing response, the judicial response, the extra prosecutors we've made available, the extra officers to deal with public disorder, the fact we've made more space in the prisons, the decisions we've brought forward, there are spaces in the prisons now for the people who will be charged and convicted for their role in the disorder. If we go back to the day before the riots, does Labour understand why white working class communities feel because I've met people, I went to the BH, I went to the streets, they say we, Radio 4, don't report on crimes committed by asylum seekers. The asylum hotels don't go to a posh called the Saxon in Maiden. they go into coastal towns. Does Labour understand the hurt of working class communities the day before the riots? Well, there is a reasonable point that you've identified we have to say, yes. where the, for instance, dispersion of asylum seekers tends to go to areas where the property prices or the hotel capacity is a low cost to the state and therefore there has been in the past a disproportionate sense of, of, of how communities are asked to respond to something we all have to respond to and you know, Angela Rain as Deputy Prime Minister made that point I think during the election but I, I want to make clear that you know, white working class communities in the UK are welcoming they are people who take community and family responsibility incredibly seriously I wouldn't want to see them portrayed in a way which is which is cliched or actually doesn't reflect the generosity that exists. Can you answer the question why the riots happened? Well, I think, first of all, there has got to be an understanding that there is no causation between the horrendous events we saw in Southport and justification for the kind of disorder that we have seen. I think this has been exploited and promoted by, in the main, the far right for their own political ends. And I think, look, where people have legitimate political concerns about how the asylum system works or how immigration operates in the UK. Let's be clear, they don't respond by, by violence and disorder. I think it is a very dangerous thing to correlate those two things. And I think we've got to be clear in the separation of them in terms of how we respond to them. Jonathan Reynolds, the Secretary of State for Business for the second time in a month or so on the BH. It's just gone 20 to 10. Ed Balls quizzed his wife, the Home Secretary, Yvette Cooper, live on ITV. It prompted thousands of complaints over impartiality, but we've seen a gap for a broadcast scoop. Here's Zep Soames with some exciting music. For you, me, it is, Andrew, but for, for the ones that phone in and leave messages anonymously, it still isn't, I'm afraid. Um, on TV, I've been 
turn up tomorrow for your thoughts on migration in just a moment, but I have been mentioning um, throughout the morning how Rachel Reeves is, is facing not just a sort of £20 billion, £22 billion black hole in the nation's finances. In fact, far more concern, I would suggest, is, is this story which is a splash in the independent, that she's having to find £47 billion pounds for compensation <coughs> for historical injustices, cover-ups and negligence. It's a huge, huge amount of money, and may explain why Reeves has also confirmed that she intends to roll back on her pre-election pledge not to raise taxes, which is slightly concerning. Jonty Brew, uh, freelance journalist, public speaker and media consultant at Jonty Brew Media, joins me to discuss the region. Thing. It's not as if um, uh, you know we only 
just discovered a compensation culture. Oh. They need you. Thanks. 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 It was great. Thanks. Um, I, 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 you have no idea how, how, how much of a relief this is to us. Started this this morning preparing for the show. Oh, I'm my book. Bloody hell, 47 billion pounds black hole. Oh, yeah, we are stuck. And thanks to you, I now realise that there's really not that much to be concerned about. This is Matthew Wright from LBC. We're down to we've got the last uh, 15 minutes to spend together, and hopefully I'm going to wrap it with as many of your thoughts on immigration, positive stories as immigration as I can, and we're also uh, maybe going to be looking at um, some AI teacherless classrooms too. All of that after the latest LBC news headlines from Jenny Bosley. The funeral of one of the three victims of the Southport knife attack at Easter Silver and Gear takes place this afternoon. The Justice Secretary submitted that coming down hard on those involved in recent disorder will put extra strain on the courts and prisons. And HUK is urging the elderly to stay inside this afternoon as temperatures begin to rise. LBC weather dry and very warm with some long sunny spells and highs of 28 degrees. LBC Travel, I'm Anne-Marie Walsh. The M1 is closed northbound for accident investigation work between Junction 12 and Politic and 13 at Bedford. On the M25 anti-clockwise, there are delays towards the Dartford Tunnels as the right-hand tunnel is closed for roadworks. Embarking, a car has broken down on Lovers Lane southbound at the A13. One lane is closed for recovery work. In Hendon, on the North Circular, two lanes are closed westbound at the Great Cross Flyover for emergency water repairs. And in Ealing, the Uxbridge Road is closed both ways for a procession between Northfields Avenue and Armington Road. On the tubes, minor delays on the Central Line and on the Bakerloo Line between Queen's Park and Elephant and Castle. Coming up at 10 on LBC, Paul Brand. Has social media become a cesspit not worth waiting around in? As one minister says she's scaling back her use, should we all do the same? serving customers they all went in and their life is still about going in so you do get this disparity between people in an office and people from home well all, all the work we've done at work on says that if you have a hybrid system people are happy so a hybrid system is good it works really well but you do need time in the office to grow and not to grow the hybrid system makes sense it's about flexibility a bit of this and a bit of that and, and you have to adjust that according to the role Okay. We know that when children don't play together outside, for example, if they're not interacting with one another, they are losing out on their vital skills for life. It's the same if you're not interacting with human beings, you don't know how to deal with confrontations or issues or nice situations in the flesh, you're going to struggle socially and emotionally. Um, right, um, I'd better go now to you, Julia. The Sunday Times signal failure of £1 billion to end phone platforms warned mega masks are springing up across the homes. Yes, I like this story because it brings Dale back into the day. He's, he's, he's a man of last. Speak up for himself. I know, but I, I don't know you want us all to talk about these things together. Uh, basically, what's interesting is Matt Rudd is investigating this £1 billion plan to end mega um, 
folk-like spots. And so these huge masts are springing up across the highlands in largely unspoiled, uninhabited areas. And it, it's going to be interesting to see what the government does with, does with this, because the telecom companies have more rights, they're paying less in terms of rent. If you do have a mast on your property, as it were, um, you get rent, but those figures are reducing, and it's becoming more and more difficult for landowners to remove these masks. And I think the question is, what will the government do? Will they continue with this plan? It was a Boris Johnson 2019 announcement um, to eradicate the black spots. So, the black spots, so this is well, the, the vast majority of not spots, says the Times and the Scottish Highlands, in order to create a 4G network, of course, 95% of the people that build the mobile network are operating properly. It's up to 261 mega miles per time, 100 feet. Yeah, well, look, uh, mobile phone masks have been a problem for decades in our country. When mobile phones first came around in the, in the 90s, uh, I don't know if anybody listening to this will recall, but they were a real problem. The groups sprung up all over the place to oppose them, and they, and they were stalled. And the government declared them nationally vital infrastructure, and they changed plans so that they could just go up and they couldn't be stopped. And there's a trade off here, right? Uh, people living in their homes might want 4G, but they don't have to have masks if they want 4G. And you know, all over our country, we want them to be able to fly, to drive, we have power. That requires infrastructure as a trade off. I think this um, goes to the heart of the new government policy around growth and want to grow, which I think is wonderful. And part of that, they said, they're going to take control centrally of planning permissions to take it away from the local authorities. And if you do want to grow the economy, people need to be able to get broadband and Wi-Fi. So for me, it's a, it's a fundamental part of what a new government needs to get to grips with. Here's the interesting, by the time it took to, to get this piece written in the Sunday Times by the journalist, um, three more applications had been submitted in the Highlands during that time. I would just say there are some health considerations as to health concerns about these masks. So can I ask you about politics? Do we need to tell Radio 4 listeners that the big story is going to be people who don't like the neighbours valley a fast track? So they're I, going to be lots of people saying, Keir Starmer's ruined my view. I, well, I think that's the case, but I, I applaud what he has said and the Labour Party has said about prioritising growth. Wait, what if they ruin your view? Have you ever put a nice mask outside your garden? Well, everybody's going to feel that. And okay. as a country, we have to say, do we want to grow the economy and all the benefits that come from growing the economy? Let's go to this, because now I've mentioned you're a big donor, and you want to pick Starmer's popularity falls over riot handling in the Sunday Telegraph. Yeah, I did, because uh, that was a surprising headline to me. I thought he'd done a fantastic job. I mean, I was, I was stunned, actually, with the first sentence of the issue last week. I mean, these guys were, were prosecuted, found guilty, and sentenced within a period of what seven to ten days or something like that. I was stunned by that. I thought his focus on uh, organizing the police, organizing the criminal justice system uh, was, was just brilliant. So I didn't believe the headline, and, and of course, it brings into the story Musk, doesn't it? Elon Musk, ah. who, uh, who famously, uh, uh, infamously intervened and, and, and declared that we were going to see civil wars in Britain as part of his latest kind of BS campaign on X. The fact okay. that BS campaign on X. Let me ask you all about Keir Starmer and Elon Musk. Mark. Who do you who do you prefer, Mark Keir Starmer or Elon Musk? <laughs> I, I think your Keir Star is a very decent, <laughs> hardworking, capable man, and I think Elon Musk is on the spectrum, and I think he has issues and challenges with what he says and how he says it, and you have to take that into account. Right. So I'll, I'll, He's, I'll, 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 Musk has suggested that we're that that, that Britain. Uh, is going to turn into a, um, a Soviet n a Union. Mm. Yeah, but we have list We do have listeners on the spectrum I'm, who I'm, don't want to be insulted for simply being on the spectrum. I want to jump in. his behaviour? Yes, I wanted to jump in there because being on the spectrum doesn't make him a bad man. I'm on the spectrum. Mm. And people on the spectrum uh, aren't necessarily bad. I, I think of it like Transformers. If you've ever seen the popular film Transformers, you get good Transformers and bad Transformers. Musk is a bad Transformer. Uh, I'm just going to leave us with the um, headline of page six of the Sunday Times. Starmer's armour holds up for now. And it's uh, if you want to read an in-depth um, story about Musk versus Starmer, this is the paper that you want to be reading this morning. And what, what would you like me to comment on that? Well, I, I, I feel, I'm waving at you because I feel it's an interesting story that's going to develop because I think Keir Starmer is going to return to online regulation and I feel Elon Musk and Keir Starmer is going to be a story to watch. I was wondering what you think of how long he's been in government. So Keir Starmer should get on with the job of um, governing the United Kingdom, doing what he wants to do about growth, sorting out the NHS and everything else and he shouldn't be worried about what Elon Musk says on Twitter. I think that Elon, I mean as I said before, 
Um, Elon says things, and I don't think always he thinks them through or properly understands. He says things, and we should just understand him for that. So Piston has got much bigger things to do than worry about. It's interesting. It's interesting that we cannot. I don't think the UK government and any, any other government can just ignore what's happening on digital platforms. But that is where everything is moving. Okay. Do you think we can't overlook the role of social media in these riots? Mm -hmm. Thank you all. We've done found so much news in such a short space of time. Thank you. Please all come back. Thanks, buddy. Today's producers were Luke Hastings and Liv Facey. The studio director was Lee Wilson. The editor, Tom Baker. We leave you with the genius of John Lennon, who soothed fractious times at the Olympics. And I had no family, so I needed to hire a nanny because I also wanted to work. And it was, you know, a daunting experience for me. And um, a Romanian, many people from, they were all amazing. And one particularly stood out. She said, I'm Romanian and people really so hard to find a job. People think we're gypsies. People think we're, you know. And of course, there's bad apples in every group. Yes. But she came and she just said, no, I have actually absolutely no experience being a nanny, which is, of course, you know, not what people normally want to hear. But I said, no, it's what? I said, neither do I. So why don't we just do it together? She was just so wonderful. She, she treated the child like it was her art child like it was her own and and ever since then I like we call it Team Romania I can't help but surrounding myself and our family with lovely people from the country and people that they meet you know we've often hired for you know different my, reasons yeah, my, country my, my eyes I can't deny are, are getting a little bit moist listening to all this so oh, same, same no. question same question I put to Phil how do we communicate your lived experience, this Romanian lady, how do we communicate to, to the people whose hearts are filled with hate? Can it be done? Phil seemed to think it can't. Well, I, I guess it's not fair for me to try to speak for others, but I just impart that um, to anybody and everybody by smiling. Even just yesterday, I was carrying something 